Hello, I'm Eddie Kraft, and we welcome you to WNBS Live. This program comes to you each Wednesday from 7 to 7.30. Our speaker is Brother Wesley Simons, who is the director of the Tri-City School of Preaching and Christian Development. He's also the minister of the Stony Creek Church of Christ in Elizabethan, Tennessee. We want you to be a part of our program by watching us each week, and now we present unto you Brother Simons. Good afternoon. Welcome to WNBS Live. Thank you so much for being a part of our Bible class tonight. And we want you to be a part not just by listening and viewing the program, but you also can send in a Bible question and or make a comment. And they'll put it on the screen for us. We'll be glad to deal with your question or your comment. We hope that if you're a shut-in, you don't attend services anywhere, that you'll make this a regular practice each Wednesday night. We're in the book of Acts, and we're studying chapter 2, and we're down to verse number 16. Now keep in mind what happened in chapter 1. Jesus Christ has been raised. He stayed on earth for 40 days, taught his apostles, ascended back into heaven, and then Peter and the rest of the apostles went back to Jerusalem from Mount Olivet, and there they replaced Judas Iscariot with Matthias, and Matthias is now a part of the twelve apostles. When we come to chapter 2, we're on the day of Pentecost, and we're in Jerusalem according to Acts 2 and verse number 5, and Pentecost according to Acts 2.1. When all of a sudden there's a sound of a mighty rushing wind designed to bring people to where the apostles were. On each of the apostles, cloven tongues of fire set upon them. And then the people came and the apostles are going to preach to them. The apostles spoke in tongues. Various nations and languages were represented. And the apostles, by the gift of the Holy Spirit, the baptism of the Holy Spirit, as a matter of fact, and the apostolic office, could speak to anyone in any language without studying that language. Isn't that amazing? That's tongue speaking. Now, the jibber-jabber that people do in denominational churches is not biblical tongue speaking. We noticed that last week. We'll not go back into that unless you have a question along that line. Now we come to verse number 16 of Acts 2. And the Bible says, But this is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel. And it shall come to pass in the last days, saith God, I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams, and on my servants and on my handmaidens I will pour out in those days of my spirit, and they shall prophesy. And I will show wonders in heaven above and signs in the earth beneath, blood and fire and vapor of smoke. The sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before the great and notable day of the Lord. And it shall come to pass that whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved." Now this is a quote from Joel 2, 28 through 32. Now I want you to notice Joel said all this was going to take place in the last days. Tim, are we in the last days now or will they be out there in the future shortly? Where are we? We are in the last days now. Matter of fact, over in Hebrews chapter 1, uh, verses 1 and 2, it says, God who at sundry times and divers manners spake in times past unto the fathers by the prophets hath in these last days spoken to us by his Son, whom he hath appointed heir of all things, by whom also he made the world. So we're, we've been in the last days for what we say close to about uh, 2,000 years. That's right. So we are in the last days. And what's so great about Joel's prophecy as found in Joel chapter 2, verses 28 through 32. Watch this. I'm going to read verse 32. And it shall come to pass that whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be delivered. Now watch this. For in Mount Zion 
and in Jerusalem shall be deliverance, as the Lord has said, and in the remnant whom the Lord shall call. So notice where the apostles were located. They were in Jerusalem. That's where the Lord told them to go. And the prophecy here of Joel says, And it shall come to pass that whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be delivered, for in Mount Zion in Jerusalem shall be deliverance. That's great, Tim. Now, Vince, we've done this before, but we're going to do it again. We want to drive this point home. I want you to read Luke 24:47. Now, Tim says that the salvation and deliverance, in essence, was going to start in Jerusalem. Well, we're going to see if we can establish more evidence along that line. So if you'd read for us Luke 24, 47, please. And repentance and remission of sin should be preached in his name among all nations, beginning at Jerusalem. Notice, repentance and remission of sins will be preached in his name among all nations, beginning at Jerusalem. Where are they? Acts 2, 5, Jerusalem. What did Isaiah 2, 1 through 4 say? The word of the Lord would go forth from Jerusalem. Salvation in the sweet name of Jesus Christ had a beginning point, not with a woman at the well, not with a rich young ruler, Eddie, not even with a thief on the cross. No, that's exactly right. Because here, Joel said it would begin at Jerusalem. And that's why repentance and remission of sins was preached in his name beginning at Jerusalem and not the cross. You know, something else you see a beautiful thing about the nature of prophecy. Sometimes a prophet would give a prophecy that had really nothing to do with the time period in which he was living. That's right. It's going to come to pass in the last days. And we see Peter, an inspired man, says this is the, what Joel said. So we know it's the last days from that point, too. If it's not what Joel said, it wouldn't be in the last days. But if it's what Joel said, it would be in the last days was going to occur. Well, I was interested there in the last verse of Joel 2 that he read. Notice this time in Acts 2 we read where it said, Whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. And the last verse of Joel 2 says that this remnant whom the Lord shall call. Mm -hmm. So the ones that are calling on the name of the Lord are the ones the Lord's calling. That's now, right. if we, when we get on down there, we're going to see that uh, in Acts 2 that Peter will say that this promise, Acts 2, 39, this promise to you, your children, all far off. Now watch it, as many as the Lord our God shall call. That's right. So you got whosoever is calling on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Now you got the Lord is calling them. That's a perfect fulfillment of Joel's prophecy. That's right. The very words that Joel used, the very words that's used in Acts 2 uh, are so beautiful and help us see that. That's, that's great. Now Hannah, if you'll turn to John 6, 44, 45, we are going to try to find out how one is called. It says, the Lord calls one. Mm -hmm. The issue is how's, how is one called? Now, many in the denominational world will tell you, you've got to have a direct operation of the Holy Spirit. Or you've not been called. You've got to have an experience. You've got to see an angel, see God, see Christ, something along that line. But Hannah, what does John 6, 44, 45 say? No man can come to me except the Father which has sent him me draw him and I will raise him up at the last day it is written in the prophets and they shall be taught all be taught of God every man therefore that hath heard and hath learned of the father cometh unto me not that any man hath seen the father save he which is of God he hath seen the father now I want you to notice they shall all be taught of God so becoming a child of God is a hearing a learning and obeying process. That's exactly right. And you know, West, Romans 10, and we may get there in a moment, but Romans 10 also says, Whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. And when you go study that context, it says the same thing John 6, 44 says, doesn't it? You can't believe in someone whom you've not heard, and you can't hear without a preacher. How can he preach except you be sent? And so they tell him to call on the name of the Lord, they'll be saved. Then he's got to tell him how... That's done. You can't call on the name of someone you don't know. That's right. You know, I was, well, I was talking about this a while back in the gospel meeting, and I pointed out there was a preacher at a funeral, and he said, I'm going to tell you what to do to be saved. I said, no, I'm not. I said, I'm just going to tell you what the Bible says. I'm not going to add a word to it or a word take from it. And he went to Romans 10 and said, whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. And he acted as if just quoting that to that audience without any addition or subtraction would let the whole audience would know what to do to be saved. 
That's not even true in Acts 2. They were no, right. and brethren, what yeah. shall we do? That's so right. what he did was really nothing. He told those people nothing. It may have sounded good, but it proved nothing. That's exactly right. See, uh, like Eddie says, Joel is being quoted here, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And then Peter goes on and demonstrates that Jesus Christ is everything he claimed to be. But when those people cried out, men and brothers, what must we do to be saved? Peter could have said, I told you. That's right. Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. I told you, didn't I? No, this is the first time salvation is being preached in the sweet name of Jesus Christ. Therefore, they need to be more definitive in what it takes to call upon the name of the Lord. That's right. Okay, I think we have a question, do we? What does it mean to call upon the name of the Lord? That's a good question. Now, let me give you a definition for calling upon the name of the Lord. To call upon the name of the Lord means that you appeal to God for the blessings that he has offered through the process which he has prescribed. Mm -hmm. Now, at times in the Old Testament, to call upon the name of the Lord is prayer. Now, if that's what he prescribed, that's what you got to do. In the New Testament, here, when salvation is being taught in the name of the Lord, what does it mean to call upon the name of the Lord? They didn't know. They want to know more about it. Men and brethren, what shall we do? Then Peter said unto them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins, you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Tell for crying out loud, are you trying to say that baptism has something to do with calling upon the name of the Lord? Oh yeah, matter of fact, over in Acts uh, chapter 22 and verse 16, you got three chapters in the book of Acts that deal with uh, the conversion of Saul of Tarsus. You got Acts chapter 9, Acts chapter 22, and Acts chapter 26. Well, here's Ananias, who's sent by the Lord uh, to uh, go to Saul of Tarsus, and he tells him this, as recorded in Acts chapter 22, verse 16, And now what tearest thou? Arise, and be baptized, and wash away thy sins, calling on the name of the Lord. Uh, I was teaching the class uh, a couple of weeks ago and uh, dealing with Acts chapter 9 and Acts chapter 22, showing uh, the people there what Saul had to do in order to be saved. Well, he saw Jesus on the road to Damascus. Did that prove that he was saved? No. That didn't prove because you had people that uh, saw Jesus, turned around and walked no more with him, as recorded in John chapter 6, but that didn't mean that they were saved. I said, watch this, Acts chapter 22 and verse 16. And now what tellest thou? Arise. Be baptized and wash away thy sins, calling on the name of the Lord. He was praying. There was Saul sort of Tarsus. He was praying. Did that mean that he was saved? No. Matter of fact, yeah, according to Acts chapter 2 and verse 21, it shall come to pass that whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. I said, now watch this. Him praying did not mean that he was saved, because here comes out a nice to him, saying, and now what tell thou? Arise and be baptized, wash away thy sins, Calling on the name of the Lord. And it shall come to pass that whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. He at that point when he was praying had not had his sins washed away, nor had called upon the name of the Lord. Here comes out a nice turn and says, Brother Saul. Did that mean that he was saved? No, that just simply means that he was a brother Jew, just like on the day of Pentecost. Men and brethren, what shall we do? In Acts chapter 2 and verse 37. I said, Now watch this. Acts chapter 22 and verse 16. And now what tell us thou? Arise and be baptized, wash away thy sins, calling on the name of the Lord. It's just that simple when we put the Great Commission together found in Matthew 28, 18 through 20, Mark 16, 15 through 16, Luke 24, 47 through 49, and John 20, verse 23. It perfect harmony. Exactly. So proves he couldn't have been saved on the road to Damascus then. That's a good try. That's right. Now, let me play the devil's advocate or state what some of you might be thinking. Well, fellows and ladies, if one has to be baptized in order to be saved, then you've got a man standing between a sinner and God. Ed, you believe there's someone who stands between a sinner and God when it comes to going to heaven? I sure do, and God put him there. God said to go into all the world and preach the gospel. That's putting somebody between uh, the world and God himself. So we're commissioned to go preach. Now in Acts of Romans 10 again that I mentioned earlier, 
he talks about that and says, listen, how can they believe on him whom they have not heard? How can they hear without a preacher? Well, last time I looked, that was a, that was a man. That's right. And therefore, there was a man standing between uh, God and that person. And God put him there. Well, That's right. You didn't put him there. That's and you right. know, this idea, Wesley, that uh, no man's there, that God just saves you somehow, uh, separate and apart from any other in, uh, person or individual being involved, if that's true, then if I'm not saved, it's his fault. If anybody's lost, it's God's fault because it's God's responsibility then to save him personally without any uh, person involved in it, then we don't even need to be here. We try. Any a lady called uh, Lies to Truth Radio and trying to promote the concept that she didn't really need the Bible, she made this comment. I was saved before I heard one word from the Word of God. Well, that's impossible. Mm-hmm. You know why? Because you've got to be saved by faith. Okay. You know how faith comes? So then faith cometh by hearing, hearing by the Word of God. Now listen, if you think there's not someone standing between you and your God, you're just as wrong as you can be. I can name eight people standing between you and your God. Exactly right. Matthew, Mark, Luke and John, Peter, Paul, James, Jude. Those men stand between you and heaven. And if you don't listen to those men, you're not going to go to heaven. And so, it's not going to do any good to say, oh, if you, if you say somebody's got to baptize you, you've got somebody standing between you and the Lord. Like Eddie said, we didn't set up that process. God Almighty did. And so then, we're going to honor God's process, whether men honor it or not. Wes, you may remember the passage that escapes me now. I believe it's in Corinthians where it says that God has placed this in earthen vessels. That's right. Well, if God has placed it in earthen vessels, then that means God placed somebody, and you named them, at least those, that God placed between him and and the people that needed to be saved. Well, I just, we need to think about this. It was the Lord that sent Ananias to Saul. Exactly. It was God that sent Peter uh, through, through the angel there uh, sent Peter to Cornelius in his household. That's right. That's right. Now let me say this. Now I want you to, to think about the seriousness of this. Eddie said the gospel was put in earthen vessels. He's right. Read John 16 where Jesus promises that those apostles would be led into all truth. I want you to notice that the Holy Spirit made these apostles earthen vessels to proclaim the truth. The earthen vessels wrote it down, and now we're to carry it to other people, go into all the world, preach the gospel to every creature. Friends, we're not ashamed of God's process, and we shouldn't be ashamed of the Lord's process. You know, it amazes me, these people, Eddie, that, you know, and, well, you got somebody standing between the sinner and God, they'll talk about, we need to send missionaries overseas. Why? I mean, is that preacher standing between the sinner and his God? Why not keep that missionary home? Well, absolutely, and, but if they send him, what good is he? That's right. Because then you got a man standing between them and their God, you know. That's, that's right. You're exactly right, and, but people will say stuff, and they may be honest and sincere, but it really doesn't make any sense. Okay. They've got the same problem. Those that teach the false doctrine of faith only, they got to go to the person and say, do you believe in Jesus Christ? they got the same problem. Yeah. Now, Micah, you've been awful quiet. I know you've got a comment that you'd like to make. Go ahead and turn your mic on and make your comment. Well, I was just uh, looking at some of these other passages here in the book of Acts and how that you were listing there, that there were eight people that actually stand in between an individual and their God. Well, Paul uh, would actually say that there would be a ninth person and that these people actually oppose themselves when he came preaching them the gospel. Right. So, you know, even though we have people today who will try to make it all about the preacher and the problem with them bringing the gospel. Right. When the simple truth is brought out, most of the times, the one that stands between a person and God is themselves. Yeah. You know, not letting themselves... I'll be willing to humble themselves and subject yeah. themselves to the gospel. That's right. No, Caleb, you made the interesting point there. I hadn't thought about it in this light, but how did that person come to know that no one stands between them and God? Somebody, Wesley, had to tell her that, in my judgment. She didn't come up with that probably on her own. Yeah. And so, you know, 
how'd she get that idea? If we to do what call on the name of the Lord, mm -hmm. do things by the Lord's authority, whatever you do in word and deed, do all in the name of the Lord. She would have to be doing that in the name of the Lord. Now, where did she get that information? That's right. That you don't have to have a person between you and God. That's right. That's right. So, we want to commend you to the Word of God and the study thereof. Amen. Why does the Bible say that parents are to bring their children up in the nurture and the admonition of the Lord? Ephesians 6, 4. Are those parents standing between their children and God? Absolutely. You better believe it. And we're not ashamed to say it. And they better be. Oh, they better be. They're all answer for it come Judgment Day. Yeah. Now, let's talk about the Holy Spirit here for a moment and uh, a few other things. I want you to notice the Holy Spirit is going to come up on all flesh. And when it says all flesh, that's in the limited. It's not talking about atheists and infidels, pigs and dogs. Okay. It's talking about those who are God's children. That's those under consideration. It says your sons, your daughters, your young men, and your old men, and then it says, and on my servants, and on my hand ladies, I will pour out in those days of my spirit, and they shall prophesy. Now I want you to see something here that gives people a lot of trouble. Look at verse 19. It says, and I will show wonders in heaven above, and signs in the earth beneath, blood and fire and vapor of smoke. Then it says, The sun shall be turned into darkness, and the moon into blood, before the great and notable day of the Lord. Now we got people that's waiting for the moon to turn to blood, and the sun to turn to darkness. I wonder when those signs will take place, Wesley. They already have. It says it would have to take place before that notable day of the Lord come. Well, what does this language imply? What does it teach? Anytime you've got the sun being darkened, darkened or the moon turned to blood or luminaries, stars or whatever being darkened, it's talking about the fall of a government. That's, right. That's what it's talking about. Well, what government's got to fall? What government has he got to take out of the way before Christianity can be established? Judaism. And according to Colossians 2, 14 through 16, the old law was nailed to the cross. God is through with Judaism, and now he's ready to set up a brand new religion, salvation, through the sweet name of Jesus Christ. And Tim, I know you're dying to comment on that. Yeah, that's exactly right. Matter of fact, uh, to show show the language here of a fall of a, a government or a nation, Isaiah chapter 13, the burden of Babylon. I'm going to read verses 9 and 10. Behold, the day of the Lord cometh cruel, both with wrath and fierce anger, to lay the land desolate, and he shall destroy the sinners thereof out of it. For the stars of heaven and the constellations thereof shall not give their light. The sun shall be darkened in his going forth, and the moon shall not cause her light to shine. So that there was the burden of Babylon, and the same language employed there, uh, with, uh, as Peter brings forth Joel's prophecy. Now, dealing with the Old Testament law system, it had to be changed. The Old Testament law system had to be changed in order for Jesus Christ to be our high priest. That's right. Now, under the law of Moses, the high priest come from the tribe of Levi. But Jesus Christ was from the tribe of Judah. Over in Hebrews chapter 7, beginning in verse 12, for the priesthood being changed, there is made of necessity a change also of the law. The law had to change in order for Jesus Christ to be our high priest. For he of whom these things are spoken pertaineth to another tribe, of which no man gave attendance at the altar. For it is evident that our Lord sprang out of Judah, of which tribe Moses spake nothing concerning priesthood. So once again, under the law of Moses, the Levites, or one from the tribe of Levi, from the family of Aaron, was high priest, Jesus Christ could not be high priest under that law system. For Jesus Christ to be our high priest, the law had to be changed. As Wesley pointed out, it was nailed to the cross according to Colossians chapter 2, verses 14 through 16. As a matter of fact, according to Ephesians 2, 14 through 16, it has been abolished. Watch this over in Ephesians 2, 14 through 16. For he is our peace who hath made both one and hath broken down the middle wall of partition between us, 
having abolished in his flesh the enmity, even the law of commandments, contained in ordinances, for to make in himself a plain one new man, so making peace, and that he might reconcile both unto God in one body by the cross, having slain the enmity thereby. That word abolish simply means to make inoperative or null and void. So the Old Testament law system, when our Lord went to the cross, he nailed it to the cross, he made that system null and void. You know, where we're so far from Pentecost sometimes, we don't appreciate the things that they would have appreciated. Like you said, when he talked about the moon being turned into blood, they were accustomed, Wesley, to that kind of language. That's right. Because as Tim read rather mm -hmm. relative to Babylon, if you go back when Damascus fell and other of those mm -hmm. nations back in the Minor Prophets and also in Isaiah, you are able to see that that same kind of terminology was used. And I try to get people to see that from time to time. While we're, we're looking for moon to be turned into blood and we're looking for the sun to be turned into darkness and all of that kind of thing, that's not what he's talking about. He's talking about this power, like you said, Wesley, is going to come to pass. I'd like for our people that study with us by Internet to go back and study and read those Old Testament prophets, and they'll be surprised how many times they'll see language employed. Now, these signs were to confirm the word, right. Mark 16, 20. They didn't have the King James Version. All of us have Bibles tonight, mm -hmm. and if you say something, I can go over here and see, did he, did he get that right? You know, they didn't have those, not in a completed form. They had some scrolls that they read from. But we got a beautiful blessing tonight. We have the complete written revelation. So if somebody's teaching something, we can go there and check them out. Mm -hmm. You know, and see with a much easier situation than what they've had in times gone by. So these, these things, legitimate miracles, and I've heard Wesley say, and I think it's a great point on A Rise to Truth and others, we believe in every miracle that occurs in the Bible, that That's we're right. given in the Bible. That's we right. don't believe in the Jim Jones so-called miracles or the Oral Roberts so-called miracles. We believe in these miracles. And if anyone could even work a miracle today, it wouldn't provide you with any more than what the written miracles provide you with. That's right. But if they were going to be continuously done, Wesley, why would we need any written miracles at all? That's right. You ever thought about it? The Bible says these signs are written mm -hmm. that you might believe, not continuing that you might believe. They are written that you might believe. I think that's John 20, 30, and 31. Yes, so I want you to notice God knew a day was coming when the miracles would cease. So he said, I'm going to write them down to make you a believer. And so we believe that with all of our heart. Now, here's what's sad. How ungodly the doctrine of uh, premillennialism is that they're going to take away the greatest of all sacrifices the greatest of all high priests. And they're going to discard him, in essence, set the old temple back up and offer animal sacrifices. What an insult to the Son of God and the religious world has bought into this nonsense. Right. And as a matter of fact, if you go back under the old law, you're in trouble. Vicki, you look up Galatians 5 for, uh, for us. Galatians 5, verse number 4. Now, what we're going to learn here is you can't just go by any testament you want to live by. You go back and get under the wrong testament, the old law, you actually fall from grace. Read that for us, Vicki. Christ has become of no effect unto you. Whosoever of you are justified by the law, you are fallen from grace. No, notice if you're trying to be justified by the old law, you fall from grace. Oh, I know there's people out there that teaches that you cannot fall from grace. Can you imagine spitting in the face of the Holy Spirit, as it were, saying, I know you said you could fall from grace, but I don't believe that. They will judgment day. That's right. I guarantee you they'll believe it judgment day. And we don't want them to have to wait for judgment day to find out what's going on. Amen. Now, Micah, I see you got that uh, microphone and you'd like to comment. Yes, sir. I was going to give an example as to how far they'll actually go with that once they've always said. I've actually heard a preacher say, that if he were to go out and commit fornication, you know, somebody is not his wife, and then he were to step outside of the house and then to be struck by a car before he repented, that he would still go to heaven, even though Paul in his First Corinthian letter, uh, chapter 6, clearly says that fornicators are not going to see the kingdom of heaven. That's right. That's right. It's just, you know, it's a complete contradiction as to what the Bible actually says. That's right. You know, and Micah, one thing we've pointed out on 
Uh, a lot of times I say, well, if you're saved, you won't do that. Right. Well, you'd never know whether you're saved or not then, because right. if you did it, you'd be in. And look at right. Paul and David. He apparently wasn't saved. That's exactly. He couldn't have been. According no. To that According to that uh, reasoning, uh, and they'll make this argument, a child of God wouldn't want to do it. You know, not just uh, well, wouldn't do it, wouldn't want to do it. What about David? And James writing to brethren, mm -hmm. said you're drawn away of your own lust and entice. Yeah. So we're, you know, and some people have the crazy idea that you don't, you're never tempted again, I guess, when you yeah. become saved because if you're tempted, then you could fall, you know, so who knows. But this passage, like you said, man nails it. You can fall from grace. That's right. And I had a man call a rise of truth one time and said, I haven't sinned in seven years. Huh. I said, sir, you just did. You lied. You know, when somebody says that, they're calling the Lord a liar. Now, I want you to know something. You're not perfect and we're not either. Only one being was perfect, the Son of God. And he died for you and me so that we could go to heaven. Mm -hmm. All right, we only got about four minutes left. Go ahead. Leslie, uh, in that passage you had Vicki read, uh, Galatians 5, 4, if you keep reading, get down to verse 7. This gets back to your point. You know, if you're a Christian, you wouldn't want to do that anyway. Yeah. Well, Paul said to those same Christians, you did run well. Who did hinder you that you should not obey the truth? Now, here these people were saved. He said you can fall from grace if you go back and keep this Old Testament system. And then he says, you did run well. Well, there wasn't no you did run well. It's you couldn't keep from running well if you were saved. And so you, every verse you read just about, was it Richard Curry says about every verse in the Bible condemns once saved, always saved. And he, you know. Pretty much on the money. Yeah. All right, let's look at 22 and 23 right fast. It says, you, this is Acts 2. You men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man approved of God among you by miracles and wonders and signs which God did by him in the midst of you, as ye yourselves also know, him being delivered by the determinate counsel and foreknowledge of God, you have taken him by wicked hands, crucified and slain. Now I want you to notice that Jesus Christ freely laid down his life. Now Jay, if you'll read John 10, 17 and 18. John 10, 17 and 18. And what you're going to see here, the Lord freely laid down his life. He said, nobody takes it from me. I lay it down. I have the ability to lay it down. I have the ability to take it back. This commandment I received of my Lord. Read it if you would please. Therefore doth my Father love me, because I lay down my life, that I might take it again. No man taketh it from me, but I lay it down my, of myself. I have power to lay it down, and I have power to take it again. This commandment I have received of my Father. All right. Okay, now James, we've gotten everybody in but you. Now would you like to make a comment of any kind? Actually I do. You're going to have to take a microphone if you're going to make a comment. <laughs> Okay. Okay. Well, one comment I'd like to make is in Galatians um, 5 4, when you're talking about you can, you, can, you can fall from grace. Well, if we can't fall from grace, then there's no need of repentance. For example, in Acts chapter 8, a great chapter, by the way, and we have Simon the Sorcerer that became a Christian. Well, when he sinned, wanted by the Holy Spirit, then there was no need for Peter to tell him repent if he was already said to begin with. If you cannot fall from grace. That's right. That's a good point. That's good, yeah. good point. Ryan, how much time we got, buddy? About one minute. Well, I got to quit. All of us have to quit. <laughs> hey, thank you for being with us. If you'll hear this beautiful book, the Word of God, put faith in Jesus Christ, repent of your sins, confess Christ before men, be baptized for the remission of your sins, Allow the Lord to add you to the church you read about in the Bible, not a man-made church. You be faithful to the Lord. When the road is called up yonder, you'll be there. Thank you for being with us. And may God richly bless you as you continue to study the greatest of all books, the inspired, inerrant, perfect will of God. Hello, I'm Eddie Kraft, and we welcome...